Mount Zion Church, here we are on this snowy day, ready to study the Word of God. I'm so glad that you have joined us. You know, you can find all of our Bible studies on our website, mzpraise.org. Just go there to the website, look for Bible study, click Bible study, and there they will be. We are studying right now the book of Acts, the Acts or Actions of the Apostles, those first followers of Jesus. This is the history of the followers of Jesus now going to all the world to tell everyone about this amazing Savior who changed their lives, who gave them hope, who gave them courage, who gave them strength, this Savior who brought forgiveness of sin. This is the story of how they went and just told everybody they could about him. So we're reading, asking God to speak to our hearts. There's so much in just each sentence Almost every word of the Bible, there's just so much there, and that's what we're doing. We're asking God to speak through us, through these words. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we do thank you. It is so good to read your word, so good, Lord God, to know that your word, as you tell us, is living and active. Lord, that you are at work speaking to our hearts as we go to your word. So we ask that you would give us uh, understanding Give us the ears to hear, Lord God. Give us the heart to receive what it is that you are speaking to each one of us. We pray for all those on our hearts, for all your people everywhere. We thank you, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are in the book of Acts, chapter 13, at verse 1, and we will pick it up right there. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, uh, first of all, the church at Antioch, so that would be in the region of Syria, so to the north of Israel. There's this congregation. And one thing we can say right at the beginning here is, you know, sometimes when we read different names in the Bible... Uh, we get so confused, how are these properly pronounced? And you know what the truth is? Nobody really knows. These are ancient languages. So different scholars have different guesses on how these names were pronounced. I'm going to pronounce them the way I believe they were. Some of the scholars that I read that uh, persuaded me, these are the ways to pronounce. Other people think they were pronounced differently. But what's very interesting here is that we are seeing right here in this first sentence a glimpse of the church, so the followers of Jesus, who were breaking down the barriers between races, nationalities, tribes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because here we have a very diverse group of people. Now, though the Roman Empire was huge and had all kinds of people in that empire, because then Romans had conquered nation after nation after nation, right? Everybody pretty much stayed to themselves. And the Christians are doing something that was radical. The Christians were breaking down those racial barriers. They were coming together. They were worshiping God together. They were doing life together without the racial national walls between them. So it lists some of the, the persons here in this congregation in, in Antioch, it says there were, first of all, it says there were prophets and teachers. So prophets, persons who were preaching, proclaiming the word of God. And then teachers, teachers who were teaching the word of God. So when we do a Bible study like this, we're, we're teaching. We have all of our different Bible studies and we have persons who will teach our Bible studies. When a preacher stands up to preach, so if I'm preaching on a Sunday morning, then that's like the prophets here proclaiming the word. It's not a teaching moment as much as it is a proclaiming the word. So list some of those persons who were the prophets and teachers in the congregation there at Antioch. So first of all, we have Barnabas, who we've already uh, seen uh, earlier in the book of Acts here. And then we have this man, Simeon, who was called Niger. So Simeon, called Niger from Africa, Lucius of Cyrene, so Cyrene would be down in Libya in North Africa. Simeon might have even been from not even North Africa, perhaps 
uh, further south in Africa. Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now here's a very strange thing about that. A lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. So here, one of the, the Herods, right? The, these, this series of kings over this whole region that the Romans had put in power. And they were pretty horrible people. And we've already seen the persecution that various of the Herods had brought against, first of all, Jesus, right? When he was born, the king, the Herod of the time, right, launched a, just a slaughter, a massacre of all the baby boys that were born because remember those wise men came and said, where's the baby who was born to be king, right? And then we, we saw Herod launching persecution in Jerusalem. But here now, as a member of the church, one of the followers of Jesus, a man named Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So this is Saul, who we first uh, came across here in this book of Acts, who was, you know, uh, hating the followers of Jesus. He is a, an Israelite, uh, a man determined to hold fast to the truths and traditions of, of Judaism, right? But doing so in a way that filled him with anger and hatefulness to others, to those that he felt like were enemies of Israel or enemies of the true faith. And here he is now worshiping Jesus. And we've already read the story of how Jesus got hold of his life. So just in that sentence there, we see this, this diversity of people, right? People coming from all different places in life. And they are one now in Jesus. And so that's the beautiful thing. If you get to be part of, let's say, one of our connecting groups here at Mount Zion, one of our small groups, right? People are coming from all different places in life. But we discover that in Jesus, right, walls that we might have between us are broken down. Socioeconomic walls. This person has a lot of money. This person doesn't have any money, right? Racial walls broken down. Whatever they might be, we find that in Jesus, we become one. So at verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So they're worshiping the Lord. So we, you know, we were just given a list of a few people here, but the congregation is obviously much bigger than that. Uh, it was just giving a list of maybe some of those who were recognized as leaders of the congregation. And so they're all worshiping the Lord and they're fasting. So to fast means to go without food for a time for the purpose of humbling ourselves before God. So I asked Mount Zion Church to consider fasting one day a week. So we've set aside Wednesdays, some, you know, I believe, you know, instead of rigidly saying, okay, I'll always fast on a Wednesday or I'll always fast on a Friday, just to get that routine, that discipline, I will set aside a day a week. So we've set aside Wednesday, but sometimes that works for me on a Wednesday and sometimes it doesn't. So here they are, they're fasting, they're worshiping, they're humbling themselves before God, they're giving thanks to God. And it, it tells us that the Holy Spirit said, so the Spirit of God who dwells in our hearts spoke to their hearts and said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So he's saying to them, Barnabas and Saul, these two among you who are prophets, teachers, set them apart for this work now. And this work is going to be sending them from place to place to place to place. And so that's what we're seeking to do when we worship the Lord, right? When we come together in, in our connecting groups, uh, we're seeking to listen to the Spirit of God talking to our hearts. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that you want us together to do? You know, Jesus had promised his, his disciples, look, when I go to the Father, I will pray. I will ask the Father to send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to you. So the one God who's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Son, goes to the Father and says, send the Spirit. Just as you sent the Spirit to me when I was there on the earth, Jesus is saying to the Father, send the Spirit now to my followers. And that's exactly what the Father does. We put our faith in Jesus. The Father fills us with his Holy Spirit. 
right? And so now the Spirit of God has spoken to them as they're worshiping, as they're fasting, saying, this man Barnabas, this man Saul, set them apart for this work now. I'm going to send them from place to place to place to place. So at verse 3, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So they all gathered around them. They, they placed their hands on them. Just picture now a whole group of people, maybe Saul and Barnabas kneeling there, and they're all gathered around, and they're praying for them, and then they send them off on the first of these many journeys that they will take, bringing the good news of Jesus to person after person after person. You know, uh, when the Lord speaks to your heart, will you go and do what he tells you to do? When the Lord speaks to your heart about just picking up the phone and, and calling somebody who needs a word of encouragement, will you do that? When the Lord speaks to your heart about getting involved in a ministry here in the congregation, will you do that? When the Lord speaks to our hearts here together about initiating some ministry, will you support that ministry? What is it that the Lord is saying to you? Is he saying, speaking to you about a change in your life? This is going to be a pretty radical change for Barnabas and Saul, right? They are heading off into, you know, who knows where. They don't know where the Lord's going to take them. They don't know what's going to happen, but they're going. And, right, it always takes you, you have to take that first step, and then the next step, and the step after that. How, how awesome it was that they had those around them who were fasting, who were praying for them, who were, you know, sending them off, saying, God bless, brothers, we'll be praying for you. It's so good to have people around you. Get that support group. Join one of our connecting groups. Create a connecting group. Get those people in your life who are praying with you, who are encouraging you, praying for you, so that you know as you say, yes, Lord, I will do this thing you're telling me to do. So you know that you're surrounded by encouragement. You're surrounded by prayer. So at verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So they down, go down to the coastline of Syria on the Mediterranean Sea there, and they sail from there out to the island of Cyprus. At verse 5, when they arrived at Salome, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. So they arrive on a port city there on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea, and there they go first. Barnabas and Saul are both Jews. They're Israelites. And this will become the pattern of their many journeys. The first place they go is to their fellow Israelites, their fellow Jews. And there they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues there in this city of Salome. So we remember, of course, that Jesus was an Israelite, a Jew. And the Father sent him to his own people, right? And that's what Jesus did. And then as Jesus is, knows that he's heading to the cross, but more than that, when he is raised up from death, is with his disciples again, before he ascends to the Father, he says, now go to all nations. Go to all nations. And we've seen how that was quite a, a hard thing for those first followers of Jesus who were all Jews, who were all Israelites, to go beyond their own people. Because yes, they were in that Roman Empire where everybody stayed to themselves. You stayed with your own group of people. And if you were part of a small group of people like the Israelites were, uh, you were a group of people who had a whole lot of animosity, oppression, racism, et cetera, et cetera, coming against you all the time. And, here's, and you built up big walls between yourselves and others. You tried to stay away from other people as much as possible. You had a lot of burning resentments in your heart against other people. And here's Jesus saying, now you go to them. Go to them. And here we're looking at Saul, who, okay, first he's going to his own people there in, on Cyprus, but then we're going to see he's going beyond that. For Saul to do that, that was really hard, to go beyond his own people because he, before Jesus got hold of his heart, he had such an anger and a hatred against others, but here he is, ready to go, 
ready to go first to his own people and then beyond his own people to whomever the Lord sends him. So do we have that willingness? Do we have that willingness to do whatever the Lord tells us to do? To go to whom? To love to whomever the Lord tells us to love. To bless whomever the Lord tells us to bless. Right? To make whatever changes in our lives the Lord tells us to make. Do we have that willingness? Barnabas and Saul here are exhibiting a willingness. They, they, they jump on a ship. They're sailing across the Mediterranean Sea. They're, they're heading out to points unknown. They had the willingness to say, yes, Lord, I will do what you're telling me to do. Well, there at the end of that, verse 5, it says they had John to assist them. So this is John, who was also called Mark, who later writes the gospel according to Mark. So he was a younger man, presumably, assisting them. At verse 6 then, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. So they're going from place to place through this island of Cyprus, and they come uh, to this city of Paphos, so far uh, inland from the port city there of Salome, uh, far across the island from, from Salome, and they come across, it says, a certain magician. All right, we kind of um, expect that maybe from Romans, all different peoples, right? Uh, but this says a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. A, wait a minute, a Jewish man who's a magician who's practicing magic? What? So this gives us a little clue how maybe outside of the land of Israel itself, right, how influenced by the Romans and all the ungodly ways of the world that Jews who were living in all these various places. So here's a man living out on that island of Cyprus, right? And he's been so influenced by the ungodly ways of, of the world around him that he's, he's practicing magic. So what were magicians in that time? Well, magicians uh, would claim to be able to heal you, claim to be able to put curses on your enemies. They would claim to be able to make good things happen in your life. Uh, they would have potions that you were to drink, which mostly had the poppy in them, so it's the same as dope today, all right? Did you know that the word sorcerer literally means uh, one who sells drugs <laughs> because sorcery is pharmacia, use of drugs? So here's a man who perhaps is, you know, selling his potions in the marketplace doing magic cures for people, putting curses on your enemies. So obviously he says a Jewish false prophet, false prophet, someone who's claiming to speak the word of God, but is not doing so honestly. You know, Jesus had warned us about the false prophets. He said there will be many. Now this man was not doing this all in the name of Jesus, but he was doing it in the name of the Lord God, right? Uh, and Jesus said, look, there will be many false prophets speaking in Jesus' name, speaking in the name of God, but who are false, who are not sincere in their faith, who are not speaking the word of God as it is. They're speaking the, the lies of this world. And you know the thing about the false prophets is they never look like a false prophet. They never look like, oh, that person's not speaking truth. That person's not speaking uh, what is right and good. Uh, and so what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. And what did he mean by fruit? Does he mean you'll know them by the fact that huge crowds follow them? That's the fruit of their ministry? That, wow, that person built that huge church? That person created that huge following? No. When Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit, what do you mean? He meant the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, joy, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, uh, goodness, self-control, right? You'll know them by how they live their lives. And so here's a man who's clearly a false prophet. He is, he's speaking lie after lie after lie to the people that he's making his money from. So at verse 7, he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So, oh, by the way, I didn't, 
uh, mention that the name of this false prophet says Bar Jesus. So Jesus was a common name. We always think of Jesus as our, our Savior, his name, but that was a common name among Israelites. Uh, the prefix there, Bar, means son of, so this man had a father who was named Jesus. In that verse 7, he was with the proconsul, so that would be a high a government official named Sergius Paulus, so a Roman government official here in, uh, on this island of Cyprus. So this man, this government official, was a man of intelligence, intelligence who asked that Barnabas and Saul would come speak to him the message that they were proclaiming throughout this island of Cyprus. But Elymas, the magician, so Elymas bar Jesus, Elymas son of Jesus, right? For that is the meaning of his name, magician, right? Opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So this man sees a threat now, sees a threat, this, this magician sees a threat in, in Barnabas and Saul, but he doesn't want his friends or his, you know, this government official, Sergius Paulus, to start listening to them because he's got the man's attention now and he's getting a lot of money that way. And so he comes against Barnabas and Saul. You know, people have all kinds of reasons, right? We can have all kinds of reasons in our head why we might oppose the message of Jesus. Why don't we don't want to hear, why persons don't want to hear the message of Jesus, of what Jesus had to say about this or that or the other. Uh, people can come against the followers of Jesus for all kinds of reasons. This man doesn't want to lose his business. He's making money. And he doesn't want that threatened by the message of this, this Barnabas and this, this Saul. So it's just you know, right, self-serving reason for this man. But people have all kinds of reasons. Maybe you've struggled. You've struggled in your faith for, who knows, maybe there was this thing that happened in your life and you've tried to overcome it, but this thing always creates doubt in your mind, in your heart about Jesus, about the, the, the truths of Jesus, the word of Jesus, and, and it's something that you've had to struggle with all kinds of reasons in our brains, right? Why we, we will resist what Jesus is saying to us. This man could have had his life changed. He could have had his life changed if he had willingly listened. He could have had it changed in a wonderful way. Oh yeah, his life would make a big change. He would lose what, what he had, but what he could have gained if he had listened what he could have gained if he would have listened. But he's going to oppose this message now that Barnabas and Saul have about Jesus. What we can gain if we're willing to listen. When you're reading the Bible and you read something that is just hard for you, it's just hard for you. Do you have a willingness to listen? When the Lord's speaking to your heart, and he's telling you to do something that you don't want to do. Do you have a willingness to listen? Well, this man, Elymas, Bar-Jesus, this magician, he does not have a willingness to listen. So at verse 9, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Now, we see something here. Saul, who was also called Paul, from this point on in the book of Acts, and then through the rest of the, all these many letters that this man now, Paul, writes, we see no more mention of the name Saul, but rather Paul. Now, you've heard me say in the past that God gave Saul a new name, Paul. And you say, well, it doesn't say here that God gave him this new name. Why do you always say that, Craig, that God gave him a new name? Well, Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul is how Romans would have named him, would have spoken to him, right? So maybe God didn't say to Saul, I'm going to now give you this new name, Paul. But by changing Saul's heart, 
by sending him now, by giving him a willingness to go to somebody like this Sergius Paulus, a Roman official, and tell him this good news of Jesus, right? God has given Saul a new name. You're now going to be someone who has the willingness to go and to love and to share and to tell about Jesus to people that you formerly hated, people that you used to despise. God changed everything about Saul. So yeah, his new name was Paul, a man who was willing to sit down and talk with and love people that he used to hate. Maybe your name used to be fear, and God has given you this new name, courage. You're not living in fear and worry and anxiety anymore. Maybe your name used to be anger or hatred, and your new name now, the name God has given you, is love. Now you love people that you used to just always be angry with. Right? What is that new way, name that God has given you? What is that new thing that he's doing, has done in your life, or is seeking to do now? In your life. This is huge for Paul to now be known as Paul. If anybody would have called him Paul before this, before Jesus got a hold of his life, he would have been furious. But now he embraces the name. He embraces the name because he knows, right, that he, the Lord, is sending him to person after person after person after person who desperately need to know Jesus. All people that he saw. And his old life would have hated. So he embraces this new name, Paul. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit comes upon him now. He sees this, this, this Roman official now who wants to hear this message. But he also sees this, this man who corruptly has no willingness to listen who only because of his self-interest of continuing to, to make money through his magic and through his connection with this high Roman official is going to oppose this message of Jesus. So Paul looks at him intently, right? At verse 10, and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. Well, he has some hard words to say here. Now, what's pretty fascinating about these hard words that he speaks, he's speaking them to a fellow Israelite. And there's a Roman, high Roman government official standing right next to that fellow Israelite. In Saul's previous day, he would have been speaking those hard words at that Roman official. But here he's looking at a fellow Israelite who's a false prophet. And Saul, yeah, even in his old life, Saul despised whom he considered false prophets. But now, filled with the Spirit of God, he correctly discerns who the true, who a real, who is actually a false prophet. I mean, he, Saul despised Jesus. He didn't get it. He didn't understand. But now, filled with the Spirit of God, when Jesus got hold of his life, now, instead of spewing hatred at a Roman official, instead of spewing hatred at someone who he thought was false, Jesus or one of Jesus' followers, now, what does he do? He speaks hard, truthful words. Hard, truthful words to this Elemis bar Jesus, this magis magician. So he says, you son of the devil. Like, whoa. But now, didn't Jesus say, you're not sons of Abraham? Remember, he was talking to the religious leaders. You're not sons of Abraham. Sons of Abraham is a way of saying a true Israelite. You're not sons of Abraham. You're sons of the devil. You don't have true faith in God. You're acting like you do. You're using the name of God for your own self-centered purposes. And so you're actually a son of the devil. Jesus' hardest words he spoke consistently were to those who were falsely claiming to be godly persons, godly men, who were falsely claiming to be godly spiritual leaders. Those were the hardest words that Jesus had to speak with to those people. And so here, Paul now speaks some very hard words to a man who's claiming to speak 
the word of God. At the same time, he's probably selling his dope and doing all his other stuff, right? And so Paul has some hard words to speak to him. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. You enemy of all righteousness. What is righteousness? It's a right relationship with God that results in right behavior in your life. He said, you're not giving anyone a right, you're not pointing anyone to a right relationship with God. You're not pointing anyone to a right way of living. You're the enemy of all that. With all your magic spells, with all your curses, you would sell, you know, pay people, get people to pay you to pronounce some curse on someone else. With all your magic potions, which is just getting people addicted to dope. He says, you're an enemy of all righteousness. Now, he could have said some hard words to that Roman official, I'm sure, because I seriously doubt that Roman official was living a godly life. But this man, this magician, claiming to be a man of God, claiming to speak the word of God, that's to whom Paul has some hard words to speak. So he says, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Full of all deceit. He says, you're lying. You're lying, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying. You're full of all deceit. You're deceiving people. Wow, it is so easy to be deceived, isn't it? There are people who sound, when they speak, like they are just speaking such powerful truth. Such powerful truth. And they're full of all deceit. They're lying, lying, lying. You know, that's why I say the false prophets are not easy to recognize by their words. Because anybody can speak words that are very convincing. Very convincing. So William Shakespeare, he he once wrote, he said, the devil quotes scripture for his own purposes. That is very true. Who did the devil quote scripture to for his own purposes? To Jesus himself. When the devil was quoting scripture to Jesus. Right? Wow. So, Yeah, the devil will quote scripture for his own purposes. False prophets will quote scripture for their own purposes. Presumably this Elamis, Bar-Jesus, this magician, was quoting scripture, mixing it in with all his magic and everything else. And so Paul says, you're full of all deceit. You are deceiving people. You're, You're doing it for the purpose of money. And so the Lord tells us to beware of false prophets. Beware of them. They're smooth. They have huge crowds following them. Beware of them. Beware of them. So he says, full of all deceit, he says, and uh, he says, and villainy. He says, you're a villain. You're a criminal. This is, this is criminal, he's saying. You have taken the word of God. You've taken the the goodness of God, and have used it for your own purposes. Your own purposes. Wow. So he says, you will, he says, will, and then he ends with a question. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Will he not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? The straight paths of the Lord. You know, the word of God There's a whole lot in it. Oh, yeah, there are parts that are difficult to understand, aren't there? But there's a whole lot in this word that is very simple and straightforward. And when those who make the word crooked, what are they doing? They're twisting it. They're turning it. They're making it. uh, They're using it for their own purposes, whereas God says some things very straightforward and plain. So Paul now confronts this false prophet, this man who is using the word of God for his own purposes. He goes on at verse 11. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And Paul, now filled with the Spirit of God, says the Lord's going to make you blind now. He's putting his hand on you, his hand that's going to push you down because you have been using, falsely using his word 
for your own purposes. And the Lord is going to push you down. He's going to make you blind for a time. You won't even be able to see the sun shining in the sky. Wow. Haven't we seen in the news, even just in this last year, one Christian leader after another fall in some scandal? Persons who were claiming to be men of God, persons who were claiming to be speaking the word of God, but they were false prophets. And they, their, their lies became known. Their immoral behavior became known, right? And so that's exactly what Paul is saying to, to this magician, right? He says, the Lord's going to reveal you for who you are. You know, Jesus once said that words whispered in secret rooms will be shouted on the housetops. In other words, we can't hide. We can't hide our sins. And especially if you're someone who's teaching, preaching the word of God, eventually, eventually, if you're doing so falsely, if your heart is not right, it will be known. It will be seen. I remember many, many, many years ago, I was in a huge gathering of people, and I'm seeing the man up front speaking, uh, and he was, he was speaking the word of God. And in my heart, in my heart, I said, there is something deeply wrong here. I was, this was in a huge crowd of people. And in my heart, I said, that, there's something wrong. That man, his heart is not right. Sure enough, about four years later, it comes out in the news I was amazed. God gave me that discernment years before. There is something deeply wrong there. Wow. And so Paul, he, the Lord gives him that discernment right in the moment and said, this is about to happen to you right now. And so immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. So, so Paul... Uh, you know, pronounces all of this and uh, says, you know, Lord's going to blind you. He's, he's going to push you down. He's going to take your sight from you. And it happens immediately, immediately, so that now he cannot see and he has to be led by the hand. So look at verse 12 then. What's the result of all of this? Then the proconsul, this government official, believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So Paul and Barnabas had been sharing to him. Uh, uh, the, the religious leader had asked, or the government leader had asked, tell me this message that you have. Tell me about this Jesus that, that you are proclaiming. So they're sharing, they had been sharing with him about it. Then this, this magician guy is coming against them. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, you're lying, you're a liar, you're false, you're an enemy of righteousness, and the Lord's going to push you down now. He's going to take your sight from you. It happens. And so the government official, astonished at the teaching and seeing now the power, seeing the power of God right in front of his eyes, believes, puts his faith in Jesus. Wow. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing puts his faith in, a Roman official puts his faith in Jesus as Paul and Barnabas are telling Jews, Israelites, we know what most of the Roman officials thought of the Israelites, but they couldn't, but this man couldn't deny the power of what he was hearing and of what he saw. He couldn't deny it. His heart was persuaded, his mind captured by what he heard and by what he saw. You know, if we're just about talk, so let's say a church is, they, they got great Bible studies, they got great preaching, right? But they don't do anything. They got great Sunday school classes, but they don't go and do anything for a hurting world, a needy, lost, hurting world all around. They don't do what the scripture says to open your hand freely to the poor and needy. They don't do what Jesus did to pay attention to those who are forgotten and ignored by everyone else, right? So faith without works, that's what James said, is dead. So this man hears this message and he sees the power of God then 
at work. He hears and he sees. So when people hear the words of Scripture, when they hear the words of truth, and they see in our lives, this is not just words for them. This is not just words, right? This is faith put into action. So that's why we say here at Mount Zion, who are we? We are people who pour out our hearts in prayer. Right? We're people who get strong in the word of God. And we are people who put our faith in Jesus into action. So this Roman government official believes. So look at verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and come to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. So they sail now. So they had come into the port city of Salome. They had pretty much crossed the island. And now they set sail from Paphos. They go north now over, uh, across the Mediterranean up to the coast of what would be Turkey today. And they come to this place called Perga. It says John, so John Mark, uh, who would later write the gospel according to Mark, leaves them at this point. So Barnabas and Paul are there. John Mark now goes back down to Jerusalem. At verse 14, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. So they come to, again, they go first to the synagogue, always went to their own people first. And so this is a different Antioch now. The Antioch where they started was in Syria. So this would be up where Turkey is today, or Asia Minor, as it was called then, right? So they go to this city, they go to the synagogue, they sit down at verse 15. So synagogues, uh, the synagogues in the little towns and villages, uh, let's say Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, were small little rectangular buildings. Synagogues in some of these bigger cities could have been very large buildings. So we don't know, but they sit down. At verse 15, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So here's the thing. In that day, a synagogue, so a synagogue where Jesus grew up in Nazareth, here this synagogue in this place called Antioch, they didn't have a rabbi as a synagogue today would have a rabbi assigned to that synagogue or a pastor assigned to a church, right? Instead, there were someone or in bigger synagogue persons called the rulers of the synagogue who would arrange for visiting teachers, visiting rabbis to come and speak. And so here come in now Barnabas and Paul who sit down and apparently the word got to the rulers of the synagogue. These are two teachers of the word. These are two persons who teach the word of God. So after the scripture is read, a message is sent over to them. So perhaps the, rule, the rules are sitting up in the front somewhere and they send someone over with a message uh, saying, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it now. So they're invited to speak. At verse 16, so Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. So Paul invited now to speak. Paul stands up and speaks. It says, and motioning with his hand. That might give us a clue. This is maybe a large synagogue. Not sure, but kind of get that, that sense. Motioning with his hand, maybe pointing to all the people present. He says, men of Israel and you who fear God. So he says, first of all, my, fellow, my brothers here. So it would be the men in the synagogue, right? And uh, the women perhaps in the back of the synagogue. That's the way they did it. Uh, or perhaps not in the synagogue at all, depending on where, where they were, what was going on in that particular city. Uh, but he says to them, men of Israel and you who fear God. So those would be not Israelites, but others who had come to believe in the God of Israel. They had not converted to 
Judaism, not gone through all the rituals of a conversion uh, to Judaism, but they did believe in the God of Israel. So he says to them, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now what we can take from that right there is, can we imagine just Paul motioning to all the people present, kind of if this is a large rectangular building, maybe even turning around and just looking at everyone. And by saying, men of Israel and you who fear God, he's saying, everyone in this place, wherever you've come from, whatever's going on in your life, listen, listen. Am I willing to listen? Am I willing to listen? The scripture says, be slow to speak and quick to hear. Be willing to listen and listen and listen. That's why preachers have said, uh, you know, there's a reason why we have two ears and one mouth, right? God was telling us, listen, 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 far more than you speak, listen. One time many years ago, in fact, it was when I first came to Mount Zion Church, I knew I needed some guidance. I knew I needed some wisdom. And I went to a a colleague, a, a, a pastor, a brother uh, in Christ who was a pastor. And I went and I was seeking some wisdom and I made an appointment. I went and sat down with him and, and I was sharing my heart and I shared my heart for a few minutes and then he started talking and he talked and talked and talked and talked for an hour or more. He hadn't heard. He thought he knew why I was there, but he gave me a couple minutes to talk. He hadn't really heard my heart yet. So he talked and talked and talked. I really didn't get much out of it because he hadn't listened for where my heart really was, what I was really needing. And so here's the Lord saying to us, listen, listen, listen. When you come into my house to worship, listen. Be willing to listen. Don't close your ears. Don't close your mind. When you hear something from Scripture, when you hear that preacher say something that is stepping on your toes, listen, listen. Will I listen to the Lord speaking to my heart through a teacher, through a preacher, when I'm reading the Word of God? Will I listen when someone is pouring out their heart to me, or will I just start talking? (laughs) You know, I heard a a phrase, uh, okay, maybe not so polite, but sit down, shut up, and listen, right? Right? That's what we need to do a whole lot of times. A lot of times we talk so much because we don't want to listen. And here's the Lord saying, no, just sit down, close your mouth, and listen. So, verse 17. So Paul now, he's addressing the synagogue, everyone there. He says, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. So Paul begins now to recount the history of God's relationship with the people of Israel. So you remember that God first related, what did he say there? Uh, God chose, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers. He first chose to relate to the people of Israel. Of all the people in the world, he chose to relate to this one very tiny, very small group of people. And he would relate to them, right? Right? for many, many, for thousands of years before reaching to all the world, which is what he was doing right here as as Paul and Barnabas now are going from place to place to place. It was beginning. He was beginning to reach to all persons of the world. But Paul starts here his talk in this synagogue by saying God chose our fathers. He chose the people Israel, right? And look at that. He says, and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. What was their stay in the land of Egypt? They were slaves. He said he made the people great during their slavery in Egypt. Right? We look back on the hardest times of our life, and sometimes we say that was awful. There was nothing good that came out of it. In fact, if we will look for God's purposes, if we will look for God's purposes as we look at our past, as we consider the things that we have been through, we can see that God brings greatness out of the hardest times, out of our biggest struggles, is when God brings greatness to our lives. If you're walking through that hard time right now, right, what did Jesus say to Peter? What I'm doing now, you don't understand, but 
afterwards you will understand it, right? That's this assurance that we have, right? That God is always, our Lord Jesus is always at work in our lives. Always at work in our lives. He brought, he made the people great between their slavery in Egypt. Did they know he was at work among them during their time of slavery? Probably not. Were, were they, uh, you know, like glad they were in slavery? No, certainly not. But did God create a greatness in them? Yes, just as he creates greatness in us through our hardest times. It says, and with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And he delivered them from their slavery. With uplifted arm, with God lifting up his arm, saying, come, my people, with God lifting up his arm and parting the waters of the Red Sea as they escaped from the Egyptian army who was pursuing them, right? He led them, he delivered them from their slavery. You're in some hard time. God's at work in ways that you can't see. But have this assurance, he will deliver you from, he'll deliver you from that hard time. He delivered them from their slavery in Egypt. And for about 40 years, he put up with them. <laughs> he put up with them in the wilderness. For about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. Uh, were they grateful? You would think they would be so grateful, so thankful. Our God just delivered us from slavery. We, we were slaves down there in Egypt, and our God just set us free. Were they grateful? No, not in the least. They looked around. All they saw was a barren wilderness right? They, they, God said, I'll take you back to the land that, that you used to have, but you got to walk through this wilderness time. And they were scared to death. They thought, we're going to die out here in this wilderness. We're not going to have any water to drink. We're not going to have any food to eat. There's poisonous snakes. They're killing us, right? And we're, we're going to die here in this wilderness. It says, God put up with them. He was patient with them as they were walking through that wilderness, that wilderness time. So at verse 19, and after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. So this is the land they had left. You remember they had gone down to Egypt because there was famine in the land that God had first given them. It was a drought, right? So there was famine. The crops were dying. The cattle had uh, no grass to eat. There was famine. So they said, all right, down in, the, in Egypt, there's always the Nile River. There's always water. That means there's always food. So they go down, but they're enslaved down there. And then God, you know, he does great things in their hearts. He gives them a strength and a courage, a greatness in their hearts. During those hard times, he delivers them, but now they're in, but now they have to go through this wilderness time, which was hard. God was patient with them. He put up with them. And then it says that other people had come to occupy the land that they had left. So God moves those other people out so his own people can come back in. He gave them their land as an inheritance. He said, this is the land I gave to you. This is the land that will always be your land. Now, we look at that, we say, wait a minute, after destroying seven nations, well, what about those nations? What, what about them? Well, does, does that mean, well, God didn't care about any other people? No. No, that does not mean that. That means that God works out his purposes, right? He works out his purposes in all the chaos and the, the warfare and the hatred of this world. God works out his purposes. And we, we say, how could, how could God destroy? How, can I, how am I supposed to believe in a God that would destroy nations, Right? Couldn't God just have given his own people another land or something? How am I supposed to believe in God? Right? Well, um, if I say that, then, then, then I'm saying, well, God, I, I, just, I, I just don't believe in a God. If I'm, if I'm going to say I can't believe in a God who, who destroyed seven nations, then that's saying then I just can't believe in a God who is beyond my understanding. Or I can't believe in a God who would do things that sound cruel and hateful to me. Well, we know that God is love. We know that. 
we know that we are commanded to love. We know that we are commanded to love our enemies. We know that we are commanded, what, even to bless our enemies. We are commanded to forgive those who have done us wrong. We know what God has commanded us to do. We know that. God said, turn the other cheek. They hit you on one side of the face. Don't go fight them back. He said, turn the other cheek. Let them hit you again. That's what Jesus commands us to do. So when I read this, I say, God, I don't understand, but I know what you told me to do. You've told me to love. You've told me to forgive. You've told me to not let the sun go down on my anger, not to hold my anger against other people's. Right? You've told me what to do. You've showed me how to live. I don't understand. I can't comprehend all your purposes, but I know how I will live because you have commanded me to live. You know, we take things in our own hands when we get angry, when we get hateful, when we won't forgive. We're taking things in our own hands. We're saying that we're as smart as God when we take things in our own hands and don't obey Jesus. You know, Jesus said, judge not, do not judge. If I'm critical of others, I'm judging others, I'm taking the place of God then. I'm saying, I know how to judge. I know who to criticize, right? I'm taking the place of God then. So we can stumble over a, a word like this that, that God destroyed seven nations. We can stumble over that or we can say, no, I know what God has commanded me to do. I know what God has commanded me to do. That I will do. I will not judge. I will not hold on to anger. I will not hate. I will not destroy. All right, the scripture says to speak words that build up, not to destroy. I will not speak words that destroy. I will speak words that build up. I will do that which lifts up. If it is God's, in God's wisdom that destruction needs to happen, then that's God. That's not me. That's not my calling. That's not our calling. Our God calls us to love, to build up. And so he gave the land then. So Paul's saying he gave the land of Israel back to his people. They were slaves in Egypt. They had nothing, but God was at work in their hard time. He put up with them. He was patient with them when they weren't even grateful, when he set them free. Now he gives them their land back. Gives them their land back. You know, maybe you lost a whole lot because of foolishness or because of what others did to you. Maybe you, you lost, you had, you had joy, you had peace, and you lost it all. Maybe through your own foolishness, maybe through what others did, maybe just through tragedy and the chaos of this world, and you lost. Our God, what does he do? He restores he restores, remember that promise? He restores the years that the locusts took. What? It would be huge plagues of locusts that would come and consume all the crops, right? And then the people, all the food was gone. They were gone. Now they were in desperate hard times and a whole plague of locusts uh, would come, right? And, but this, what does God say? He says, no, I restore the, the years that the locusts stole. In other words, I bless again. I will bless you. I will bless you. And so what he, he gave them this, this inheritance. He gave them their land back. You might have lost that lo joy, that peace, that goodness of life. You might have foolishly put yourself in slavery. God will set you free. He'll bring you back to that place of peace, that place of joy. So at verse 20, all this took about 450 years, and after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So Paul's given this history of Israel, and he said, everything I've talked about so far is about 450 years. And then he said, uh, after that, he gave them judges. Uh, so he set up a form of government for them as a people, as they got back to their land, as they settled in their land, he, he gave them a form of government. He's now building them, in other words, as a nation. He says, until Samuel the prophet, and he raises up a great prophet named Samuel. So let's stop the story right now. 
We'll pick it up next week at verse 21. We're stopping in the middle of this long speech that Paul is going to give to the synagogue there in Antioch. There's so much. This is why I say, when you read the Word of God, do it slowly. Read each sentence and think about that sentence. Think about what God is saying to you in that sentence. We're taking our time here, right? We've only read, what, about uh, 20 verses here uh, today. Uh, Ask God to speak to you through each sentence that you read. Read it. Read that sentence again. Read it again. Ask God to speak to your heart. All right, well, we're going to pray, and uh, let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you do speak. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. You go deep into our hearts, Lord God. You, you speak deep truths to us. And so, Lord, give us that willingness to listen. Give us that willingness to listen to what it is that you're saying to us. Lord, we want to hear what it is that you would say. And so, Lord, we lift our hearts up to you. We thank you, Father. We pray, Lord, that we would not only listen, but we would put it into practice. We would obey you. Lord, we would put our faith into action, Lord. And so we love you. We thank you. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, Mount Zion. We do this once a week. There's a new Bible study every week. We study the Word of God for about an hour. All the past Bible studies are right there on our website, mzpraise.org. Click Bible study and you'll find them all. God bless you. See you soon.